Welcome back to Sex Out Loud. I'm talking to Julia Serrano, author of Whipping Girl, a transsexual woman on sexism and the scapegoating of femininity. And her second book, Excluded, Making Feminist and Queer Movements More Inclusive. So speaking of excluded, Julia, um, Mm -hmm. let's talk about TERFs. Um, I want you to define what a TERF is, T-E-R-F, and uh, let's and we'll take it from there. Sure. So TERF is a term that basically it's an acronym for trans exclusive radical feminist. Um, it's a, it's a rather recent term. Um, there was a time where a large body of feminists and especially radical feminists held anti-trans attitudes. Um, this goes all the way back to the seventies and there's Janice Raymond's infamous book, The Transsexual Empire. Um, but over time, as trans activism has gained momentum, as a lot of feminists, if not most feminists, have become to realize that trans people are kind of allies in, you know, the movement to try to challenge, you know, sexism. The, the challenging the gender binary is an important part of challenging kind of, you know, gender hierarchies in our world and so on. So we've moved to a point where a lot of feminists are supportive of and allied with trans people and trans activism. However, there's a contingent of some people within, especially within radical feminism, who still hold a lot of the same old views of trans people. Um, And so the term TERF, which a lot of people who are called that refer to it as a slur, um, it actually was coined uh, and there's a Kristen Williams article about it. If you want to search, um, she has written a lot about this, but she interviewed the people who coined it. And it was coined by cisgender radical feminists to distinguish between radical feminists who are supportive of or agnostic about trans people versus those who really strongly um, want to exclude us um, from feminism and who think that we are um, we're holding back the feminist movement as opposed to kind of being parallel with it. And so nowhere is this more on display in a real way um, than at the Michigan Women's Music Festival. So for people who don't know, the Michigan Women's Music Festival is an annual event where women um, create this camp from just on this land, right? They like just erect the whole thing and... Uh, and there's music and there's community and there's classes and there's shopping and there's different parts of camp. And it's very, you know, it's very feminist. It's very body positive. It's really into accessibility issues. It's anti-racist, at least in principle. Um, but they have at some point, because they've been around for decades, um, they had to get specific about what they were going to do about trans women. And in fact, they ejected a woman for, for outing herself saying she was trans. And from then on, they formed this policy, which said that the only women allowed at this women's event are women born women. And they use Y's, uh, the the letter Y, um, meaning that you, you have to be born and assigned female at birth in order to uh, step foot in this really, you know, one of the largest gatherings of women on the planet and one of the longest running ones. And there have been protests for years and years and years. And we hear that now it's 2015 and it will be the last year of the Michigan women's music festival, which I think is good news. Uh, What about you? Um, I mean, I have a lot of feelings about it. I actually, um, the, basically the, the protests, uh, surrounding that are really what first got me into activism. Um, I had been, I mostly considered myself a performer and so I was doing trans activism by being an out trans person. And then in 2003, I went to Camp Trans, which was the annual protests of the Michigan Women Music Festival policy, excluding trans women. And that really evangelized me. And it was also really important with what ultimately led to um, kind of thinking about 
ideas that led to Whipping Girl, the way in which misogyny plays a role in how um, trans women are viewed um, and excluded in society. And specifically because uh, there was some acceptance within Michigan of people who were trans male identified, who used pronouns like he and him, and yet trans women, someone like myself, who, you know, nowadays I've, I've lived as a woman for 15 years. I walk out the door every day of my life living as a woman. And yet I'm, you know, seen as this problem. And so I worked really hard for many years as partly with Camp Trans. I was involved in it in two years. And then after that, I was kind of on my own writing about it a lot. And I really, really did hope that the policy would change. There were a number of years in there where it felt like it was going to be inevitable. And then I just feel like it's, it's stalled lately and it became clearer and clearer that no matter, no matter what happened, you know, that, that Lisa Vogel, who's the sole proprietor of, of the festival um, and a lot of the people who attend that they weren't going to budge. And so I mostly feel sad because there was a time that I really hoped it, things would change. Um, so that's kind of, I would say that's the main feeling I feel. Um, it's, it's, I don't think I would go there anyway, just because I know some trans women who have gone to the space. Um, and the politics about it are strange because they essentially had a, a policy where trans women wouldn't be thrown out, but they would be seen as disrespecting the space. Um, and I know some people were there and it's definitely not a safe space for trans women to be. Um, so yeah, I, I wouldn't have gone there if they changed the policy at this point in my life. I might have when I was younger, but yeah, so I have a lot of mixed feelings about it. Well, and the thing that you, you talk about this in your book, but, but I experienced this firsthand with the, the one and only year that I went to Michigan, um, which is around the same time. I feel like you were there, but maybe it was maybe a little earlier. Um, there, there is an obscene amount of displays of masculinity at <laughs> Michigan women's music uh -huh. festival. And by that, I mean, butches, boys with an eye, uh, trans men, gender queers, masculine of center people, um, people born and assigned female at birth who've had chest surgery, who are on hormones, who have facial hair, who could pass as men. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, it seems entirely like a double standard that because those folks spent some of their lives as girls or young women, um, that they're quote unquote allowed in the space and not you who is a woman um, I mean, what do you make? I mean, do you just think that this is gender essentialism at, at, at its heart that they're just digging their heels in, or is there something, um, is, the, is there an element of misogyny in here as well? Yeah, I mean, I definitely think, I think that there are several things. I, I definitely think misogyny is a part of it. Um, and, and I have a chapter in Whipping Girl called Bending Over Backwards, um, that where I talk about this particular issue and bending over backwards because I kind of felt like they would bend over backwards to like come up with any argument they could just to keep trans women out. Um, and a lot of these arguments were very anti-feminist. And I, I think that there's some gender essentialism there that, you know, we, you know, used to be men or whatever and we, or we've, you know, also arguments that, oh, well, we've had some male privilege. It's like, yeah, but if that, is your main, your main focus, then what about all these trans men and, and people who, once they leave Michigan, will, will leave and they'll live their lives as, as men? <laughs> um, so that clearly wasn't the answer. And then one of the things that I felt was overlooked at the time that I started doing activism about this when I wrote Whipping Girl was that a lot of this was really entrenched in misogyny. And it really hit home to me when a friend of mine at Camp Trans who worked the, the cars. So basically people from, as the cars were entering the festival, um, people from Camp Trans would try to convince people to realize the policy. Oh yeah. There's a, there's a really, really long line of people and, and they line up even before it opens. And so there's this, it's a kind of a captive audience. It's like waiting for concert tickets or something. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And I remember this one, uh, 
this one uh, trans male friend of mine, um, he was talking to people and in a car and one of them said, you know, why would trans women want to be here anyway? Aren't they afraid they'll break a nail? <laughs> and, you know, mm. yeah. <laughs> and I've encountered numerous things along these lines in the past. I definitely think misogyny is, is also a part of it. Either the perception that trans women are like, especially feminine or overtly feminine. Um, and we should say that a, a lot of the people who go to Michigan, a lot of people who are radical feminists are against femininity. Yes. Um, they eschew. I mean, yeah. I, as a femme, just so you know, I mean, as a femme, I, I felt, uh, excluded and also not safe in some situations um, because there, there also is anti-femme sentiment there. So like you said, there's anti-femininity on, on the land. Yeah, definitely. And so I, I think that that is also a major thread to this whole situation. I do think another thing that should be acknowledged is that um, I think that a lot of um a lot of, especially the lesbian community, um, part of the reason why I think trans men are kind of accepted in a way is that not all trans men have this experience, but a lot of them kind of come up through the dyke community. And so they get a chance to kind of prove to everyone that, hey, I'm trustworthy. I'm like, you know, part of the community before they transition. And they won't be completely accepted by everyone in the lesbian community, but I think there's more of a chance to, to give these people, you know, like the benefit of doubt where I feel like trans women don't get the benefit of the doubt because, you know, for me, um, you know, I mean, as I was moving through the world as male, I would never have gone into like a woman's only space or a lesbian space. I just would not do it. Right. Because I, I understood I have a certain amount of privilege and these spaces are meant for people who are marginalized in society in ways that I wasn't. Um, but then as soon as I became a woman, as soon as I transitioned and, you know, I was I identify as bisexual now, but I identified as a dyke at the time or I still identify as a dyke, but I identified as a lesbian at the time. And, you know, I mean, I had a partner who kind of had a long history in dyke communities. And so I think I was accepted because I was in this this partnership with someone who was kind of seen as a legitimate cisgender, you know, queer woman. But, you know, if I hadn't, I mean, there's the, I think people don't give us the benefit of the doubt because we weren't from the community, but we never had the chance to. So I think that's another element. Um, some of it is gender essentialism. A lot of people talk about it being about socialization, about like, oh, being socialized male, you know, that's what the problem is. And I 100% don't buy that at all. I think that that's the biggest red herring out there. I've had conversations with people about this issue. And if in my experiences, when I talk to people, I said, well, what about a hypothetical um, person who is biologically female, who for some reason was raised male and lived their whole entire lives up until young adulthood as male before they came out as being female, uh, would you let that person in? And they all said yes. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's not really about socialization. It's a mixture of essentialism and misogyny and, um, and you know, the acceptance of trans men and trans masculine people being more related to them fitting, either having been in the community or kind of not being seen as um, problematic in the same ways that trans women are. But I think this also really touches on one of the crucial pieces in your book, which is this idea that trans women are not trustworthy, you know, the trans woman as deceptive or dangerous. And mm -hmm. then the natural extension of that, which is that women and femininity is dangerous and deceptive and uh, can't can't be trusted. I mean, don't you think that that's at play as well? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I, and one of the very first chapters, I think it's chapter two, um, in Whipping Girl, it's called Skirt Chasers, and it's about how the uh, how the media depicts trans women. And I talk about mainstream media, you know, movies, TV shows at the time, etc., and about how trans women were either seen as uh, 
either being not real women because we look too much like men or we're seen as deceivers who are potentially dangerous. And in the very last section of that, I talk about this very issue. I talk about Michigan Women's Music Festival, um, turf ideology in Janice Raymond's book. And going all the way back to her book, she talks about how, you know, all the reasons why trans women like aren't women because we don't look like women and all that. And then she turns around and then says, but then there's this deceptive type, you know, and she has this whole paragraph where she talks about trans women being let into women's only spaces would eventually, of course, lead to rape, right? Like deception and rape, you know, which is like straight out of a focus on the family ad circuit today. Um, So these ideas are really, really kind of entrenched in people's brains and sadly, a lot of people who are TERFs, um, they're kind of, they, they have no, they're not recognizing the fact that these are the same tropes that are used on women in general. These are the same tropes that are used against queer people, right? If a queer person doesn't, like, announce to someone that they're queer, some people will, like, go into the so-called gay panic and might freak out about it and can accuse them of deception. These are the same tropes that are being used over and over again to marginalize people, and it's a shame that they don't recognize that.